As a photojournalist during the 60s and 70s, my photographs appeared in major magazines such as Life, Paris Match and Stern. In this video, I'll be telling you all about the cameras I used, show you the photographs I took and explain the technical problems that had to be overcome in order to capture them. I very much hope to inspire everyone passionate about photography to recapture the true meaning of traditional photojournalism by starting to tell stories with their cameras. This is my workhorse camera, the original Nikon F. With this, I shot over 85,000 pictures during my 20 years as a professional photojournalist. Today, 50 years later, it still works perfectly. During its working life, this Nikon has been smashed by a soldier's rifle during the Belfast riots, struck by a lightning jet fighter which was practicing an emergency landing in a gravel pit of Resta, dropped from 12,000 feet over France while I was covering the RAF Falcons skydiving team, and submerged in seawater at 60 meters when the watertight case containing it flooded. In this, the first of my videos, I want to describe the motor drive, a remarkable piece of late 50s technology. Under the drive itself is a power pack, which takes eight AA batteries. I had previously used an earlier version, in which the batteries were contained in a metal case, which hung over your shoulders and was connected to the motor drive by a cable. This one, known as the F36 cordless, is clearly more convenient and was in fact widely used by professional photographers. On the back of the panel is a listing of the shutter speed ranges for different frame speeds. On the bottom left is a circular control which sets the frames shot per second. At L it shoots two frames per second at speeds between one eighth of a second and one thousandth of a second with the mirror either raised or coupled move the dial to M1 and the shooting speed increases to 2.5 frames per second with shutter speeds of between 1 60th and 1000th of a second. M2 gives 3 frames per second while at H you can shoot 4 frames per second but only with the mirror raised and locked. Moving to the right is a second control enabling the photographer to take a single shot at S, continuous shots to C, while the middle position L locks the drive. Finally, on the extreme right is a window showing the number of frames shot. The top of the drive has a shutter release button, which can also be locked, and just below it is a rotatable screw, which precisely maintains the distance between the motor drive and the camera body. Finally, we have a second switch, which again allows you to shoot either single frames or continuous frames. On the battery container itself is a socket into which a cable or a remote control can be plugged for using the camera at a distance and use this when photographing cars, trains, aircrafts and buildings being deliberately blown up for a variety of reasons, from straightforward demolition to creating a stunt for film or television. Among the many colourful characters I met during my career was a truly remarkable showman called Joe Western Webb. Joe's star team was named Destruction Squad and it did exactly as the title suggests. Young men and women risked life and limb to entertain crowds with their daredevil stunts and crashes. Stunts and crashes, I have to say, which would leave today's health and safety inspectors weak with shock and faint with outrage. The series of pictures described here involved a flying family saloon, a very wet and extremely angry angler, a stunt driver, and of course, the river itself. It all started one evening when I received a call from Joe saying he proposed to jump a saloon car over the river and would I like to cover it. It seemed like an extremely interesting stunt to me, so I got in my car and drove north to the river where it was going to be shot. 
Shortly after dawn the following day, I found myself squatting on an extremely wet and muddy riverbank. To my right was the swirling grey waters of the river, and to my left the steep bank over which the car would be driven. I immediately thought that while the stunt would be interesting as it was, the sea was hardly dramatic. A few hundred yards down the river I spotted an angler fishing from a small motorboat. I reckoned if the car jumped the boat and the angler, rather than just the river itself, the sequence would have far more impact. I mentioned this to Joe, who jumped at the idea and set off to persuade the angler to move his boat directly under the flying car. The man agreed and Joe's team carefully positioned the little craft in the centre of the river and secured his position with several assistants holding onto mooring ropes. When all was set, Joe signalled the driver by walkie-talkie and we heard the car's engine start up and the vehicle start to trundle across what was actually a ploughed field. At this point I should explain that several days of rain had made the ploughed field extremely difficult and hard to drive across. As the vehicle approached, I asked Joe whether the driver was going to make the attempt. Oh, I hope not, said Joe. He can't be going more than 30 miles an hour and he must hit the jumping ramps at at least 60 if he's going to land on the other bank. At that very moment, the car appeared and I started shooting. The car continued through the air, but far too slowly, I knew, to reach the opposite bank. Realising this, the terrified fisherman flung himself over the side of the boat as the saloon car crashed into the water just a few inches from his port side. The fisherman emerged from the river seriously wet, but completely uninjured. The driver got out of the car through the open driver's window and stood on the roof, waving his arms in triumph. As I struggled up the bank, I changed my 24mm lens for a 135 lens to secure a close-up picture of the boat and the car drifting slowly down the river. A second later, I was very pleased I'd done so. The furious fisherman scrambled onto the bonnet and then onto the roof of the car and punched the driver full in the face, sending him flying into the river and giving me a great closing shot. This sequence was published in around 100 newspapers and magazines around the world, including the Daily Mirror in England and magazines in 20 countries. The spread here comes from a Finnish magazine. From this assignment, I draw three lessons. The first is to have a storyboard in your mind before you start shooting. Know what you want for the beginning, the middle and the end. The opening shot should be a real eye catcher, something a magazine or newspaper can spread big. This is what is known in the trade as the key shot. My second piece of advice is always be prepared for the unexpected, since in my experience the unexpected is far from unexpected. And finally, never be afraid of shooting too many pictures. In my day, when films were expensive and time consuming to process and print, this use of film was clear consideration. Today, with digital cameras, the sky should be the limit. It's always best to overshoot than undershoot. A discarded picture doesn't cost anything. A missed picture could cost you your career. If you'd like to see some more of my photographs, please go to www.thewayitwas.uk. If you'd like to purchase a copy of my book, The Way It Was, then please go to the same website and take a look at what it contains. If you lived through the 60s, it will bring back some memories. If you never lived through the 60s, you'll find a foreign country where they do things very differently. In my next video, I'll be describing the problems I faced whilst photographing one of Joe Western Webb's most extraordinary and potentially lethal flying cars. This one managed to travel at high speed 100 feet through the air, mostly straight down. It landed in some of the deepest, darkest waters I've ever seen. I couldn't have obtained these pictures without the reckless bravery of the driver, a team of scuba divers and the assistance of 40 very sturdy circus roustabouts whose vital role in the shoot I'll tell you all about in 10 days time.